everything we have is yours. I pray that these chains we laid down before you last night would continue to be broken. That this moment, this decision, these things that you broke last night, we would continue to walk in obedience. We would continue to walk in freedom, continue to walk in the victory that you purchased for on the cross and proved your power over death, over sin, over all these things that hinder us with your resurrection, rising from the dead. Lord, I pray you grip our hearts here tonight, that you would speak to us, that, that last night would just be a seed of the beginning of the fullness of what you have for us in the future. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you heard last night, I'm from Colorado. I grew up in Colorado, and uh, I grew up around the foothills and around the mountain areas, and uh, the foothills of Colorado are actually a, a region where the most concentration of rattlesnakes exist. The most rattlesnakes in the entire United States of America are in the foothills of Colorado. And so it was uh, a reality that I knew growing up. We were aware of them. Uh, they would be around. In fact, one time, now, you wonder what my title is at Forge. I'm the main mischief maker. I, I am known for pranking people, at least in my young, younger young man days, I'll say. And uh, so I always got some wild and crazy ideas. And so one time, my friend and I were hiking around in the foothills, and all of a sudden, as I'm walking through a field, I step on something that felt like a bike tire. But what is that? And then it went, I said, oh, that's a rattlesnake. Literally stepped on it. There's been a handful of times in my life where I've about stepped on them or had them around me, and this was one of them. And uh, I thought, rather than just leaving it, here goes the crazy ideas. I thought, we ought to kill that thing and bring it home. What's wrong with me? I don't know. Many things probably. But I thought, let's get this thing. And so we got this large tree branch. And I was like, let's snap it so it's sharp. And somehow we took care of this thing. And I said, all right, put it in the backpack. And we're going to bring it home. And the great ideas continued. I walk into the kitchen as my mom is preparing dinner. I thought, this is good. <laughs> and so I walk up to her. She's at the stove. She can't see me. And I pull the snake out and kind of hold it like this. And then I'm coming over her shoulder with the rattler. And I go right in her ear. <laughs> and she turns around. Whoa, what are you doing? Get that Satan serpent out of my kitchen. <laughs> I did move back slightly at that moment. Now, she had some reason to have a level of concern about these snakes. I know nobody really is fond of a snake tail hanging over your shoulder. But I mean, even growing up as kids, I remember we had this rock wall in our backyard and uh, we would play on this rock wall. We'd run across it. And every time we ran across this rock, we would hear this rattling inside. So our parents were like, hey, be aware. Don't, don't play around that rock wall. We gotta take care of that. We gotta do something about it. And as I think about this, as I think about this danger that was near us, sometimes we were aware, but often we were unaware. As kids, we were like, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a rattlesnake. What is that rattling? We were often unaware of this danger. And I believe as Christians in the spiritual realm, so often we are living unaware of the spiritual reality and the looming dangers that might very well be near to us. When we look at the Bible, we see terms like Satan or devil or demons or spirits. And many people have questioned recently, are these things even real? Like, are they real or are these just ancient terms for what we now understand to be scientific issues and realities? And, and maybe then it's like, okay, if they're real, are they really even prevalent in the United States and in our nation? Or, or is that just something for overseas, for other places, in, in the wild places. Or we might take it further and ask the question. Some have asked, okay, if it's real, if it's prevalent here, is it even relevant for the believer if Jesus has triumphed over all of sin and all of darkness and all of evil by his death and by his resurrection? Do these things, like, do we, they really matter for those who follow Jesus? These are questions that are often asked. Now, I want to tell you, Tonight, on this topic, it's, it's, it's a heavy topic. I realize that. I, I sense more heaviness, more conviction on this topic often. And it took me 10 years to discover 
what the Bible says about this and what that practically looks like lived out in our everyday life. 10 years, so somehow, tonight in this short amount of time, I'm going to share with you what took me 10 years to discover. So here we go. I want to dig in by looking at 1 Peter chapter 5. This is what the scripture says in verse 8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. For your adversary, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. The first thing that we see here in the scriptures is be watchful. Be sober-minded. Be focused. Be looking around. Don't be distracted. Don't be unaware. Don't, don't be unaware that there's danger nearby. Be watchful. I shared last night that I've spent time around the world in different nations. I, I shared about a woman named Mary Hamu in this context uh, where we had spent some time with this tribe that speaks an isolated click language that sounds like, they live in these grass huts that are like dome and, and hunt, hunt with bows and arrows. I mean, they're crazy awesome people. And so I was spending some time with them. And, and one time we were teaching the Bible to this guy in his hut. And it was about a 15 minute walk back to our tent. Uh, so we wrap up teaching him and the sun's going down. And we're like, well, we better get back to our tent. And so we start this 15 minute walk in the darkness. And as we're walking we had our flashlights out and all these eyeballs of these animals were lighting up around us. I thought, this is kind of exciting. Like, well, we got a bow and arrow or a club. What if, I'm, I'm sorry if this offends you, but I was like, what if we could like hunt one? We would be like heroes to the village and bring it back to the people. This is gonna be awesome. And uh, another one of my wise ideas. And uh, I'm like, let's do it, guys, come on. And so we're looking at all the eyeballs of these animals and like, okay, dude, there they are. Oh, no, they're over there. They would dart every which direction every time we pointed the light at them and started to chase them. And then as we were walking through the darkness, I looked at this bush, probably from me to the sound booth in the back, not that far, and I showed my light and I said, wow, that eyeball looks a little bit bigger. I wonder what that is. Let's check it out. <laughs> and so I started walking closer. And then I thought, it's so weird. Like this animal's not running away like anything else. I wonder what it is. Maybe we got a chance, guys. <laughs> and so I kept getting closer. And then all of a so sudden, this eerie sound rung out into the night. It sounded like, what is that? I look back and our, our, our friend Mariamu, she's booking it the other direction. She, you guys, that is the lion. <laughs> ah, no, as long as I run faster than my friends. Relax, I'm not that mean, maybe. And so I kept running. Guys, ah, ah, Lord, help us. We've got to get back to camp. And, ah. and so we start this fire, got back to camp. I can tell you that night I became slightly more watchful. Is there anything coming? What's that sound of the bush? I mean, I was very watchful. We must realize, we must be watchful about the dangers around us. I fear so often we're living like it's a time of peace, but actually we're in a time of war. Right now, according to the Bible, we are in a time of war. There is a spiritual battle being waged all around us. And so often we are so unaware that we live as if it's a time of peace. It's, hey, man, this is a comfortable day, good weather. And uh, let's, uh, let's get a Coke somewhere. Let's just hang. And we are so unaware, living our comfortable lives as if nothing's really going on. Yet it's a time of war. Revelation chapter 12, it says that Satan was thrown down to the earth by God. And then it says something fascinating. It says that he was there to wage war against those who follow Jesus. Oh, if you claim the name of Jesus and say, I want to follow him, Satan is waging war against you. There's a battle going on. It's all around us. One time there was this violin player, and uh, he went into a subway metro station and began to play his violin. And it was a busy hour, people were going to work, so one guy kind of stopped and, oh, that guy's playing, kind of looked at him, about a minute, and he's, I, 
about time for work, I better go. So he left and went on his way. And, and then a woman, in her day, she stopped, kind of glanced at him and said, oh, that's kind of interesting. But she had a, a bus to catch, so she left and went on. But then there was a lady with her kid, and her kid was, wow, fascinated. And what is this violin player? And finally, she's trying to drag her, come on, we got to go, we got to go, let's go, we got somewhere to be. And in about an hour, he made about 20 bucks, not that much. Uh, playing his violin on the street. Now, what's fascinating, people were completely unaware. They didn't see it. They didn't recognize it. This guy was one of the most famous violin players. The violin he was playing on cost more than $3.5 million and has written one of the most intricate, beautiful pieces of music. They didn't recognize what was right in front of them. And I wonder if so often... We live as if it's a time of peace instead of a time of war because we don't recognize what's in front of us because the spiritual realm is so often unseen. We can't see it, so we sometimes walk around as if it's not there, but it's very real. Imagine this. Did COVID impact this world? <laughs> you laugh because obviously, for so many reasons, for so many factors, because of government shutdowns, because of the people who were sick, because of business, it greatly impacted this world. But can you see COVID? No. It's like sickness. It's unseen, but it greatly impacts our lives today. You can see the effects of it. The spiritual battle, you may not see it. It greatly impacts our lives. We could see the effects of it, the impacts, but we may not see it in and of itself. Scripture teaches us that this may be unseen, but it's very real and very relevant to our lives. Now, we need to be aware, but Scripture doesn't tell us to be aware of it to scare us, to say, oh, no, we should walk around in fear. No, we need to view the spiritual battle through the proper lens. We got to have the proper lens. Now, what lens is that? I, I think of Jesus one time when he gets off his boat, gets onto the shore, and all of a sudden this man comes rushing down at Jesus in the book of Luke, and he comes before him. He's a man who had been crying out in the night, ah, cutting himself with rocks, all these kinds of things. And so he comes before, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Have you come to torment us? And Jesus looks at him, this man who had an army of demons inside of him. He says, get out. And they said, well, would you send us, Jesus, to the pigs? We don't want to be tormented. He says, fine, go to the pigs. And these demons went into the pigs, and the pigs rushed down into the water and drowned themselves. And then the man was in his right mind, at peace, set free, clothed. You could say sober-minded. Jesus is the all-powerful one. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Amen. That's the lens through which we need to view this spiritual battle. One time, again in East Africa, we were out hunting with the guys with our bows and arrows and these pack of, these herd of zebras ran over a hill and we were chasing them and then all of a sudden these guys just stopped. I said, guys, why are you stopping? Come on, the zebras went over there. We got to get after them. And they said, oh no, oh no, Charlie, that place is Dundubi. We cannot go there. Dude, what? 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 What's wrong with that place? And they're like, no, you don't understand. They're like, that's the ancestor spirit rocks. We can't go there. I said, why not? They said, well, listen, like, We've seen people go there and they didn't please the spirits. If you go there, you need to take an elder. You need to please the spirits. You tap on the rocks in a certain order. It goes like, ting, ting, tong, ting, tong, tong. And then you, you just, each person comes before the spirits who appear there and you say, hey, uh, we're here to bless you. Do I have permission to enter? And then they'll tell you yes or no. And if you don't do that, Charlie, listen, it's bad things happen. We've seen people lose their mind and get lost in the wilderness for three days. It's not a good place. And I said, listen, guys, um, hey, you all said you wanted to follow Jesus when we shared his message with you, didn't you? And they said, yeah, we, we do want to. So listen, Jesus is more powerful than all these things you're talking about. It's no big deal for him. We'll just go there and pray in his name, in Jesus' name, and nothing bad will happen, I promise you. And they thought about it. They said, okay, great idea. We'll, we'll bring Unawas, the village elder. We'll go tomorrow. I said, sounds good. So we went back to our camp. 
slept that night, got up again for another five-hour hike in the scorching hot sun, <laughs> and said, here we go. We started the journey toward Dundubi again. And as we approached, these guys were stricken in fear. They almost shaking. They said, listen, we can't go there. I said, guys, no, listen, like, I'm serious. The name of Jesus, he is way more powerful than these things. And they said, no, you don't understand. We cannot go to that place. I said, man, we felt convicted in our hearts that we had to go. So we went back to camp just wondering, praying, God, I don't, I don't know. Are we supposed to go or what should happen with these people? That night, one of the guys, Sigwazi, came to us. He says, don't you guys worry. I'll take you there tomorrow. Oh, all right. Next morning, launched out early again for this hike. We approached Dundubi, and we hike up this massive red rock. And I kid you not, I don't know if it's an asteroid or what kind of rock it was, but there was this rock. If you tapped on it with other rocks, tung, 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 it sounded like metal. It was awesome. And so we get to the top of this mountain rock, and we just pray, Lord, if there's any evil spirits here, we command them to leave in Jesus' name. Would you remove the strongholds of darkness on these people? Would, would you set them free that they would come to know you, to stop worshiping ancestor spirits in the sun and the sky, but they would truly know you? As we were praying, Sigwazi said, guys, I don't get it. Nothing bad's happened yet. <laughs> I said, listen, we told you Jesus is more powerful than these. You go back to the village and tell everyone what God has done for you here today. And he did. Jesus is the all-powerful one. We must view this entire topic through that lens every time. Now, this is not just an overseas thing. It's not just there. It's relevant here. It's why I seek to teach my kids. I have a two and a half year old. Now, I don't know how many things I'm doing right or wrong as a father. That's my first kid. Then I have a six month old. So time will tell. We pray a lot. And uh, I, know, I know at least I'm doing one thing right as a dad. At least one. When I take my daughter, sometimes we go to her favorite store. And she has a favorite store. And uh, so we're driving to the parking lot and she'll get so fired up knowing that we're about to walk in there. And then we walk through the doors and she goes, hey, yeah, and just bubbling with excitement. So what's the store? <laughs> it's Cabela's and Bass Pro Shop. Yes. <laughs> At least one thing right as a dad. But I'm like, listen, there's, there's a spiritual battle going on. And Satan doesn't play fair. He'll go after your kids. I've seen it too many times. Kids will say, well, when I was young, like, I had this imaginary friend, and they just wanted to approach me and talk. I mean, it's weird stuff. I get it. I can't comprehend the fullness of this topic, but I can tell you it's real and it's relevant for us today. So I've been seeking recently. I mean, as of, like, even this last week, I was praying with my daughter before bed, and so she's like, oh yeah, daddy, if uh, some evil spirit comes, a shadow or something to talk to me, I, uh, I just say, God help me. And, um, mm, uh, oh yeah, uh, in Jesus' name, go away. And uh, Jesus is powerful. Yeah, I said, that's right. That's right. Jesus is the all-powerful one. Now, why am I doing that with my kids? Because we're in a time of war. They need to be equipped. We need to be equipped. And so often, I think we live as if it's a time of peace because we're just not equipped to deal with the daily spiritual battle that's all around. The scripture says that Satan, our enemy, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I never watched a National Geographic show. I think of, I've seen some where... It's, it's like this open field, and there's like an absent-minded gazelle just hanging out. Oh, there's some good grass. How you doing? Did you see the grass? It's awesome. It's over here. Um, um, um. And little does it know, we all know how the story goes. There's some prowling lion coming through the bushes, sneaking up, about to... You know, how you doing? Good day, eh? And then the lion comes up and literally pounces out of the bushes, claws into this little animal, and shreds it to pieces. 
It's not a nice picture. And that's exactly the picture that God wants us to see. He says, that's your enemy, and he wants to destroy your life. He wants to rip you to pieces. He wants to destroy you. Be aware of that. He hates your guts. So we can't be living like absent-minded gazelles if it's nothing's going on. And I fear too often we, we're right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How you doing? All right. Mm. All right. Oh, oh, is there somebody there? Whatever, man. You know. Uh, I, I wonder how many things distract us from what's really going on. If we would open our eyes and see these people around us and even in our own lives, the things that are coming at us left and right, if we would be aware of the battle and of who our enemy is. If we're in a time of war, we need to know who our enemy is. And the scripture's very clear. John 10.10, 10, the thief is out to kill, steal, and destroy. Revelation tells us in, in chapter 8, verse 44 and 12.10, that Satan is a liar, a murderer, an accuser. The father of all lies. Man, what does that look like? I mean, if you begin to believe a lie, it could be his influence, whether that's from the culture or whispered to you from somewhere else. It's demonic. It's evil. He's out to kill and steal and destroy. Sadly, and we all know what's going on, anxiety and depression are at all-time highs currently in our nation. And we wonder what's behind that. Now, I'm not saying there aren't natural factors. I'm not saying that there's not a sinful nature in our flesh. There very well are. But sometimes these things get all mixed together and then Satan whispers a lie. Why don't you just kill yourself? Why don't you just harm yourself? Why don't you do that to somebody else? I don't know about you, but that sounds like killing, stealing, destroying to me. Do we even see this in the scripture? We do. The man with the legion of demons, the army of demons, he would cut himself with rocks, self-harm. There was a young boy. His father came to Jesus begging him, Jesus, help my boy, please. These spirits throw him into the water and into the fire all the time. Trying to kill him, take his life. Jesus commands him to flee and he's set free. We see this in the scriptures and time and time again, at least up to this point in my life, <clears throat> when a person has come to me and said, Charlie, I'm really wrestling, I'm really struggling with suicidal thoughts. Maybe that's you here tonight. I'm telling you there's freedom for you. Jesus can take care of that. He can remove that. When people have come to me and confessed that they're wrestling with this, struggling with this, we sat down to pray. Every time up to this point, not saying there's not other factors involved, but every time up to this point, there have also been demonic activity included in that. Every time. I once sat down with a girl. It was awesome. She'd given her life to Jesus. She said, I believe he died. I believe he rose and I want to follow him. She gave her life to Christ. She came to talk with me and my wife after she made her decision to follow Jesus it's like God convicted her so deeply. This chains stuff we talked about last night. She said, how do I forgive someone? This guy really hurt me. What do I do? I was like, whoa, that's an awesome question. Let's talk about that. And she forgave. But then there was something more. It was on her face. She was just sitting there looking at us like she wanted to keep talking. And so she, I asked her, well, what else is it? And she said, well... I got to be honest, sometimes I have thoughts about killing other people. Sixth grade girl, Satan, does, he doesn't play fair. I said, hey, don't worry, we love you. We love you, we'll help you, well, let's pray. We went to Jesus with it, commanded the darkness to leave. And then she was smiling from ear to ear. I've never been more happy in my life, she said. The thoughts are gone completely. I begin to wonder with this spiritual battle all around, how many lives have been lost because we've been unaware? What would happen if we were aware of this battle, if we were aware of our enemy and his tactics and lived like it was a time 
of war. Now, by now, this question comes up. You might have it in your mind right now. Charlie, this is interesting, but I've got this question. Could Christians be possessed? I mean, that's like the most debated question. I want to ask you a question. What is the dictionary definition of possession? Now you're going to say, complete control. No, it's not. We've watched too many movies. Possession means ownership. Ownership. If I possess this house, it means I own it. My name is on the deed. Good news for you here tonight. Every single person who has put their faith in Jesus Christ is owned by God. Every person who hasn't is owned by Satan. When we decide to follow Jesus, we transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life and light, and it's a glorious day. That's why we need to make a decision, a personal decision, a personal commitment to follow Jesus so that we can be in his kingdom of light. So what am I talking about then? If, If as believers we're owned by God and not by Satan, how is this possible what does it look like? like it, how does that even make sense? Ephesians chapter 4, written to the believer. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and in doing so, give the devil a foothold in your life. Ephesians chapter 6, written to believers. Satan is firing arrows at you. He's attacking you. So what is that? It's not ownership. It's influence. It's influence. How influenced are you by darkness tonight? Maybe up to this point, having been unaware. Addictions, strongholds, thoughts, things you can't seem to shake, darkness weighing you down day after day. Maybe you've been influenced by our enemy. Now, how does this happen? It's when a still small voice, this thought of darkness comes to you and you're deceived and you receive it and that moves into action. You act on it. And as you act on it, it becomes solidified in your soul. It becomes a foothold. A place where the enemy, like climbing a rock wall, can, can put his, his foot on the rock and move up and forward. A place of influence in your life. It might simply start with his tactic from the beginning. Did God really say? Did God really say you shouldn't do that? Did God really say you should live this way? Often these lies will be about who God is or about who you are. And it disagrees with what the scripture says. Now, at times we could just simply be attacked by the enemy. But often the roots of these foothills come from what we talked about last night. The chains. Things like unconfessed sin could cause the enemy influence in your life. Believing lies. Unforgiveness. Ungodly relationships. Generational patterns. These things can give the enemy a foothold that he'll grab and hold on to and influence us in a negative way. So what do we do? The scripture is clear. God lays a pathway for us. He says, resist him. Be firm in the faith. Stand firm against the enemy. We need to join the resistance. It's like in World War II, the underground resistance movement. It's like, let's be a part of that. Let's be a part of what God is up to. James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Now, in this time of war, we need to have weapons, and I don't want you to bring a knife to a gunfight. We gotta be rightly armed, rightly prepared, rightly equipped. So what are the weapons of our warfare that God has given us? Number one, you'll wanna remember these. There's five of them, five weapons. Do not forget these weapons. It's how we wage the spiritual battle every day. Number one, the word of God. Satan came against Jesus himself, our Lord. Tried to tempt him, tried to derail him, tried to detour him. Of course he can't be, he's Jesus. But Satan came after him, the accuser, the liar, the deceiver. And how did Jesus fight? He says, actually, it's been written, i.e., the Bible says, God says, you're not good enough, you'll never make it. No, God says, I can be firm in him. Oh, maybe the lie comes, he won't provide for you if you step out in faith. You should be afraid. He's not gonna, you're not gonna make it. Seek him first and all these things will be added to you. Oh, you're worthless. You've messed up. You have shame. You have regret. No, 
There is no condemnation for me because I've followed Jesus. He's wiped me clean. Is God really trustworthy? Oh, yes. He's been faithful from the beginning. The scripture says he is always faithful. He will protect us. He will provide for us. These lies may come. Fight with the word of God out loud. On one of these trips to Africa, my wife was able to come with me. We were out in our tent in the middle of the wilderness somewhere, and she had searing stomach pain. I mean, off the charts. I was sitting there going, what do I do? I mean, a hospital's hours away, a city's hours away. Uh, it's nighttime, sitting in this tent at night. And she's like, it's like a 10 out of 10. I don't, Charlie, what do I, and I'm like, Lord, help me. I don't, I'm the husband here. I don't have any idea what I'm supposed to do right now. And I just felt convicted, read the Bible out loud. Okay, I, I guess I'll try that. Doesn't seem that practical. <laughs> just to be honest here. <clears throat> I just start reading the Bible out loud out of the Psalms. Read for a little while that night until she fell asleep. The next morning, she said, wow, whenever you're reading the Bible, my pain like went down to a level two. I'm like, really? Wow, I don't know how that works. I have no idea, but there's power in the word of God. Amen. Number two, we need to fight the spiritual battle in prayer. Ephesians 6, in the midst of this spiritual battle topic, it says, Pray in the spirit on all occasions. We need to be in prayer constantly, in communication. What is prayer? It just means communication with God, talking with God. Our true power, our true weapon that will overcome all of this is prayer. Seek God, talk with God, have conversations with him. Pray. One time I walked into a hotel. This was here in our country, and um, it just felt heavy. It felt dark. It felt evil, just in the air. It's hard to explain, but it was like, man, what? I walked in, and it's just, oh, I feel heavy in here. So I went to the hotel room and just prayed, uh, Lord, I don't know what's here, but anything in this room, we command it to leave in Jesus' name. Would you protect us? Send your guardian angels. You say in Psalm 91, you can guard our ways with angels. Would you put guardian angels around this room? That'd be awesome. And uh, so I prayed that. And then our family had called the, the front desk for a rollaway bed. We needed an extra bed. And uh, the front desk person starts walking in. I saw them in the hallway. They're, they're walking toward our hotel room with this rollaway bed. Usually you'd think they'd walk it into your room for you or at least up to the door. She literally walks it about 10 feet from our door, looks at the door and goes, and straight tails it down the other direction of the hallway and leaves the bed there. Like, what? Wow, Lord, I think you just answered that prayer. That's awesome. There's power in prayer. Number two, we can fight the spiritual battle with praise. With praise. We praise God. We say, Lord, you are good. You are awesome. You are faithful. We declare his praises out loud. One time with King Saul in the Old Testament of the scripture, there would be an evil spirit that would come upon him. And David, a man of God who followed God, would play the harp and praise God out loud. And every time he did, this evil spirit would flee and run away. One time I was with a group of young people camping in Colorado, and uh, they were hiking around at night, and um, I was walking through the woods by myself at that point. I'm not really that afraid of the dark or anything like that, but I was walking through the woods, and all of a sudden, this eerie fear struck me from head to toe, almost shaking, like, what, is, what in the world, and just sensed this voice saying, I'm here to mess things up, and I was like, oh, no, 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 in Jesus' name, and I just started, I mean, listen, um, I've led worship once, it didn't go too well. Uh, you never asked me to do that again, but I started singing a song out loud. Oh, Jesus, you're awesome, and Jesus is incredible, and I just started making up worship, praise to God. I was filled with peace. He said sing a new song. He didn't necessarily say it had to sound good. Uh, praise God for Metro City's team. It sounds awesome. I just praised God, and I was filled with his peace. Ephesians 6 the fourth weapon, the armor 
of God. Put on the armor of God to fight the battle. We need to be armed. The helmet of salvation. We're secure. Nobody can snatch us from his hand. He can guard our thoughts against the attacks of the enemy. The breastplate of righteousness. Jesus' righteousness has been given to us being right with God. And as a result, we can begin to live rightly. The belt of truth holds all these things together. The truth of God. The shoes of peace. The peace of God. And then carrying that message to other people. The shield of faith which extinguishes the arrows of the enemy, trusting in God, I'm trusting him. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, living by the spirit of God, living by his life, and declaring these truths. Fifth, we see this all over the gospels. We see this all over the book of Acts. We see it time and time again. The name of Jesus out loud is incredibly powerful. The name of Jesus out loud. These are the five weapons of our warfare, the word of God, prayer, praise, the armor of God, and the name of Jesus out loud. Do not forget these weapons. They are crucial to the daily Christian life, to the spiritual battle we face. Many of you, you went to Jesus last night. He broke your chains. He set you free. Praise the Lord. There's a daily battle that comes to keep walking it out. We must Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and wage war the way he set out for us to wage. One time I was at this camp and I was uh, in the same camp uh, cabin as the the camp director and uh, he got a call from one of the girl leaders and uh, she said, hey, uh, one of the girls is like talking about weird things and and it's scaring the other girls. Would you come talk with her? And so myself and the camp director went to talk with her. Uh, we'll, we'll call her name Allie for the sake of this message. And pulled her aside and just said, hey, tell, tell us what's going on. Everything okay? And she started to describe in vivid, dark detail the, the evil darkness that was weighing down on her. Saying, I see these things and they interact with me. And the darkness is just weighing me down. And, and I don't know what to do with it. I, hey, it's, it's all right. Let's Let's pray. We began to pray with Allie. He said, listen, um, obviously this is in your life. Let's just ask Jesus, is there any, any cause for this to stay in your life? She said, okay. Uh, Lord, is there any cause for these things to stay in my life, this darkness? And she said, well, you know, uh, it's weird. I have a couple things come to mind, and it's actually that, uh, well, my dad's been in and out of prison I said, really, um, have you forgiven him for the way he's hurt your family? She said, no. I said, well, I think it's time to forgive tonight. She, she said, okay. She prayed and forgave him. And she said, you know, the, the other thing in my mind, it was, uh, well, it's like everyone in my family has depression and suicidal thoughts. I said, really, do you have those thoughts too then? She said, I, I do. Oh. I said, well, you know, the scripture in 1 Peter 1.18 says you can be redeemed from this empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. This is a, a generational pattern. Why don't we just break that off in Jesus' name? And she said, okay. So she prayed in Jesus' name. I break off this pattern of suicide and depression. And uh, I said, well, that's what God showed us. So let's just tell this stuff to leave. I said, just repeat after me. In Jesus' name, I command these things to leave my life. And I told her, listen, if a king speaks, the people listen correct? She said, yes. I said, well, if the king says the bad guys are going to prison, they're going to prison, right? She said, yeah, of course. I said, well, listen, Jesus is a really good king. These things have to listen to him. We have nothing to be worried about. So in Jesus' name, command them to leave. She said, all right. So she goes, in Jesus' name, I command this darkness, these things to get out of my life, go wherever Jesus would send them. And she goes, tears begin to pour down her face. She looks me in the face. She says, Jesus really is a good king. I'm like, oh, I about jumped out of my chair. <laughs> the name of Jesus is so powerful. He really is a good king. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He is the victorious one. And we must go to him to fight this battle. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to know how to fight this battle. If there's anything holding us back tonight, Lord, I pray you set us free of that darkness in Jesus' name. Anything that would come against, we command it to be silent in Jesus' name. Anything that it wouldn't speak, wouldn't manifest, Lord, that your voice alone would guide us. Lord, that your power would prevail. You are the victorious one. You died, you rose, you have all authority in heaven and on earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. I, I want to have a time of prayer together, actually. But before we begin that, I just feel the need to say this and to ask, listen, if you haven't made a true personal decision and commitment to follow Jesus, to confess him as Lord, to say, you're the leader of my life, everything I have, every area of my life, it's, it's yours, Lord. You lead it. You have it. Just as the worship song we sang earlier. If you have not made that commitment to Jesus, you have no power over this darkness, you're stuck. You have to follow Jesus as the first step. Now, I love that Metro City is a church that just has so much joy and so much rejoicing over what God does. It, it fires me up. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Maybe, I don't know if there's anyone here, but if you're saying, you know what? I'm not sure I've given my life to Jesus. Tonight, I want to make sure. I don't want to be stuck in the darkness any longer. I want to go into the light. I need him to transfer me. If that's you, we're going to cheer. We're going to clap. We're going to celebrate. We're here to love you, to support you. If that's you, you're saying, I I'm not sure. I want to be sure that I'm his, that I'm a child of God. I want to make sure I put my faith in Jesus, that I trust him and follow him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand where you're at? I think I want to do that. Yeah, awesome, awesome. <laughs> Woo! I simply encourage you where you're at just to say, Jesus, your Lord, I surrender my life to you. I believe in you. And, and I'd encourage you if you raised your hand to find Pastor Jeremy or Pastor Chris afterward as well. I'm sure they'd love to help give you some next steps or even pray with you if you're wondering. Now for all of us, let's go to God. Let's see if there's some spiritual attack in our own lives that we wanna give over to Jesus so that he can push back the darkness. Because we can't go out into this world and fight the spiritual battle in our culture and in our society if we haven't first gone to God and said, Lord, is there any attack on my life? Would you set me free of it? Psalm says that, Lord, you are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head. May he be that for you here tonight in this place. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes and focus on Jesus. Lord, I pray in this moment that you would lead and guide and direct us by your spirit in the way that only you could do. I want you to simply in prayer Ask this question of God. Lord, is there any spirit in my life that needs to be rebuked? Lord, is there any spirit in my life that needs to be rebuked? Ask God that question, yes or no. God, is there any spirit in my life that needs to be rebuked? Ask that question, yes or no. As is between you and God and me, I'm not gonna ask you to publicly respond for this in any sort of way. But if you sensed a, a yes of some sort or something came to mind, would you just raise your hand so I can see it? Yeah, various ones of us. Okay. Here's what I wanna ask you to do if it was a yes. Just ask God this next question. Lord, is there anything keeping it in my life? Lord, is there anything keeping this darkness in my life? If it was a clear no for you, there's nothing there, praise God. Make this a time of prayer. Make this a time to connect with God, to get up close to him, to pray for your fellow believers, to pray for your church, to pray for your city. 
But if it was a yes, you sensed there was something there. Maybe something specific came to mind or maybe it was just a yes. Lord, is there anything keeping it in my life? <laughs> what may come to mind will relate back to one of the chains from last night, most likely. A sin that you haven't confessed. A lie that you've believed that needs to be rebuked. Someone you need to forgive. An unhealthy relationship you might have. A negative generational pattern you might be living in. If something came to mind for you where it's like, yeah, I think something just came to mind. This, this is the reason it's keep, it's, Lord, if there's anything keeping it in my life, if something came to mind for that, would you just raise your hand so I can see you? Okay. Yeah. If that's you, go ahead and deal with that in prayer right now. Confess that sin to God. Lord, I'm sorry for this. Rebuke that lie. In Jesus' name, I, I rebuke this lie. Lord, I, I forgive this person who wronged me. Lord, I surrender this unhealthy relationship to, to you. Lord, I break off this generational pattern in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, do that in prayer where you're at. How many of you who first sensed, yeah, there's, there's some darkness here, but when you ask God, is there anything keeping it in your life? And it was a no, nothing came to mind or it was a no, raise your hand. Great. That's good. The enemy is attacking you, but there's nothing keeping that darkness there. Just stay in a moment of prayer. We'll come back to that in a moment. those of you who had reasons that came to mind when you said, is there anything, Lord, that's keeping this darkness in my life? If you feel, man, I'm still wrestling with that reason. I haven't been able to confess that sin yet. I haven't been able to rebuke that lie or forgive that person or whatever it might be. If you're saying, man, I think I'm still wrestling with how to, I'm still stuck on that or I haven't been able to do that yet. Would you raise your hand? Here's what I wanna ask us to do. If you're still, I want you all to join in this prayer. We're gonna to pray together. But if you're still stuck on that and you think, man, I haven't been able to get through that, I'm gonna encourage you in a moment later on to, to make sure you find someone on the prayer team and pray through that issue together. <laughs> Here's what I'd like us to do. All together, we're gonna to declare this prayer. I'll say it and we'll repeat after me. In Jesus' name, I command any darkness, any evil spirit to get out of my life. Go away. Go wherever Jesus would send you. Lord, would you fill me completely with your spirit? Amen.